last session has a is about supportive therapies in a, in a number of different issues and we and patient uh, issues as well. So uh, our first speaker uh, is very distinguished. Uh, Richard Lemon is uh, a former assistant surgeon general of the U.S. Um, and he has a Ph.D. in epidemiology um, from the University of Cincinnati Kettering Laboratories. Uh, he has been involved with asbestos and epidemiology of asbestos and mesothelioma for a long time. Uh, he's worked in, in NIOSH and actually last uh, he was retiring from NIOSH as the acting director and deputy director uh, for NIOSH and, and was involved with pretty much determining uh, a lot of the issues and risks with uh, asbestos as a carcinogenic agent, uh, including working in um, to revise the criteria for documentation um, on the standards of asbestos for NIOSH in the 1970s. Uh, he has um, been recognized with a Distinguished Service Medal and the Meritorious Service Medal from, um, from the, as while well, he's working in the United States Public Health Service. And he's actually um, was asked by uh, President Obama to uh, serve on the, uh, let's see, what was it, the the advisory board, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Presidential advisory board. He's got so many things written down here, I can't even find it. <laughs> it's like, um, and so he, he's had a long history of working uh, in the area of asbestos and, and uh, in public health, so uh, it's, it's been really fantastic that he agreed to come and, and give us a talk about the asbestos problem and, and the kind of global perspective, so Dr. Lemon. Thank you very much, Dr. Cameron. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, the slide thing is here. Okay. Let's make sure the green is there. Green, okay. It's a pleasure to be here. We're going to switch gears a little bit, and you've been hearing about medicine and science. I'm going to talk a little bit and answer for you today a few questions. This is an interesting picture. Just thought I'd throw it in of a Russian asbestos mill. Russia is the largest producer of asbestos in the world today. And it contains over 50% of the deposits of asbestos in the world. And this particular mill is one that we visited in the Ural Mountains uh, a few years ago. This is not a picture from the 1920s. And the white material you see on the ground is not snow, because this is inside that is actually asbestos. So um, they are still exporting this material to developing countries throughout the world that do not have regulation or controls on asbestos. And the Russians have worked very diligently to try and convince the world that their asbestos is harmful, harmless as compared to asbestos from other sources. So I throw this up as an introductory picture just to give you some idea that this issue of public health and the use of asbestos is not one of the distant past, but one of the current present. What I want to talk to you about today is what I call a pandemic uh, throughout the world of asbestos. And I want to answer five questions. First, is there really a pandemic of asbestos disease? Secondly, is production and consumption decreasing? Thirdly, have high exposures to asbestos been eliminated? And fourth, is exposure to chrysotile asbestos, which makes up 95% of the asbestos in the world, um, is it safe? And then finally, are low and background exposures to asbestos safe? So with that, I want to go through each of these five questions. And hopefully by the end of my talk today, I will have been able to answer for you each of these five areas. First, is there really a pandemic of asbestos disease? 
what is a pandemic first from a public health point of view let us define what a pandemic is if the slide will work uh, a pandemic is an excessive occurrence of disease in a large portion of the world so does asbestos related diseases mesothelioma lung cancer asbestosis and is now determined by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Also, laryngeal cancer and ovarian cancer have been causally associated with exposure to asbestos. So let's take an example of the H1N1 uh, pandemic that the World Health Organization labeled as a pandemic where we had 14,142 deaths worldwide in 2009. Well, what do we have with asbestos? According to the Lancet in 2008, we had around 90,000 asbestos-related deaths estimated by the World Health Organization in the world each year. By 2014, this has jumped up in deaths alone to 107,000. Now, keep in mind, statistics for counting asbestos-related deaths are very minimal, to say the least. They're very underestimated. So this is what the World Health Organization is able to actually associate with asbestos. There are probably many, many more than what this number represents. Where are these occurring? If you look at the rates per 100,000, you will see that the worldwide age standard mesothelioma incident rate per 100,000 for males, we see the high rates occurring in North America where asbestos has been highly used for many, many decades. The largest number of deaths today are occurring in Australia. Australia has been uh, using asbestos particularly uh, and construction for many, many decades. We also see high numbers of deaths in Scandinavia and Europe. Now you will note that in Africa, South America, Asia, you don't see much on the board. Why is that? Well, first of all, they don't have very good counting and vital statistics record systems. So. These are very underestimated, and what we do have and what we know are occurring are in those countries that have highly sophisticated and well-developed vital statistics record systems. So this is really a misrepresentation to use this map and say this is where all the disease is occurring because we know that in Asia, particularly, that is receiving large amounts of asbestos from Russia and Brazil, and China that their death rates as we have some information are tending to go up. The trend in age-adjusted mortality rates for plural and peritoneal mesothelioma worldwide as you'll see from this chart are still on the increase. We haven't seen this flatten out we have seen in the United States, and I'll show you some data in a few moments, where this is starting to level off. But if you look at it worldwide, the incidence is still on the increase. Eighty-eight percent of the statistics, and this slide shows you what I was saying earlier, are from the upper income countries. If you look at the time trends are showing a major shift from the upper income countries to the countries that are receiving the asbestos and using it much more widely and have less regulation and laws to pertain to controlling the use of asbestos. I hope you can see this, but I've just given you the five, as far as vital statistics are concerned, you will see that Italy, uh, the Western Cape of Australia, uh, 
Northern Yorkshire and the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland, Scotland, have the highest recorded rates of mesothelioma currently. The U.S. is about 0.9 um, per 100,000 rate as compared to these top five, which are well uh, uh, above two to three per 100,000 per year. If you look at the age-adjusted death rates, uh, worldwide the United Kingdom has the highest. Australia is right next to them. Actually, that figure is shifting, and Australia will this year become uh, greater than the United Kingdom. Italy, uh, through their shipbuilding, has had very high rates of mesothelioma also. The U.S. is about half of uh, the uh, rates in the highest countries and uh, is about average uh, for the world. And as you'll see, it's still a male-dominated disease, and that is a reflection that males tend to have more exposure to asbestos because they are the ones that tend to be working with the asbestos. Uh, this is just another slide breaking it down by the various continents showing you that we're still on an increase incidence in all areas um, of the world. Uh, Southern America, South America doesn't tend to show the same as the rest of the world, but uh, uh, the figures are very sketchy that we get from the vital statistics coming out of those countries. I'm just going to briefly talk about lung cancer because really the largest cancer incidence that is associated with asbestos is lung cancer. And uh, this has definitely been increasing and uh, continues to increase. As a matter of fact, our latest uh, statistics would estimate that there are somewhere between 43,000 and 344,000 deaths annually that are asbestos related to lung cancer worldwide. So uh, keep in mind we were talking about the 107 deaths um, that were actually recorded. This is an estimate based upon the latest World Health Organization statistics that the number of lung cancers associated with asbestos could actually be three times that number. And asbestosis. Asbestosis is the only pneumoconiosis in the United States that is still on the increase. Silicosis, bisonosis due to cotton dust exposure, all of the other dust-related non-malignant lung diseases are on the decrease. Asbestosis is still on the increase in the United States. Is production and consumption decreasing? Well, these are some pictures in, from developing countries uh, that are currently still using asbestos. And as you will see, asbestos production in it comes principally from China from Russia, Kazakhstan, and from Brazil. And each of these three countries are increasing their production as we speak today. They have not decreased the production and they're aiming the market that they're selling their asbestos to, to those developing countries, emerging economies in the world that do not have regulations that protect workers from the use of toxic materials. Worldwide consumption of asbestos between 1920 and 2003. This will give you some kind of trend. We actually peaked worldwide in the 1970s, 1980s, and because of regulation in the developed countries, the, the developed economies, this has started to go down worldwide. However, that trend is going up in those emerging economies, which I'll show you more graphically in a few moments. This is the World Trade Center attack, and it is a good lead-in to answer the third question. Have high exposures been eliminated? Well, asbestos 
was used in almost all major construction projects in the United States, particularly in large buildings, throughout the 1940s, the 1950s, 1960s. It was used in the World Trade uh, buildings. And we're now starting to see emerging disease coming out of workers. Mount Sinai School of Medicine has been following these um, workers and residents, and we're starting to see uh, disease beginning to occur. It's probably too early to see much as far as mesothelioma is concerned, but uh, we are seeing lung disease and, uh, and starting to see some increase in cancer rates. This is a picture that I took in South Africa a few years ago, where, which South Africa used to be a major producer. One of the things is that the asbestos companies quit mining because of regulation and other reasons, but when they left, they didn't remediate their problem. This blue material is the core material for chrysidolite type asbestos. And as you see, there are still a lot of mines that have not been remediated in this particular area of South Africa. The government of South Africa has pretty much left this part of Western Cape uh, without cleaning it up. And, and they're starting to get some work to do this. But this is so prevalent that even in parking lots in the small cities and towns, you can reach down and pick up an ore of asbestos. When I was there and it rained, the asbestos was so prevalent that the rainwater, when it ran off the roads, would turn blue the color of the chrysidolite asbestos. So it's quite uh, a problem. And this is not isolated to South Africa, but also in many, many other countries where asbestos was produced in the past. In Asia and the South Pacific, this happens to be a refugee camp that I visited in the Philippines. If you look at the roofing material, that is made from asbestos. The walls were made of asbestos. And the refugee camp Ran, this was during the Vietnam and Cambodian boat people moving out. Had about 50,000 refugees going through this simul, uh, through this camp. And the building material, that on the roof, as you can see, damaged by the typhoons that come through, is not unique to this refugee camp. Most of the homes in this part of the Philippines and other um, areas of the world have used this same type of material as a principal building material. This is a fairly recent picture of a asbestos plant in India. And the asbestos production is still occurring. Uh, we're still seeing a lot of disease, particularly in India, which has no major regulations for the control of asbestos. And you can see the prevalence rate at the bottom of 11.5%, which is extremely high for asbestos-related disease. And look at the concentrations, 200 to 400 fibers per cc, when the current OSHA standard is at uh, point one fibers per cc. So we're thousands of times above what is allowed in the United States. This is a plant in China. And China is a major producer of asbestos-related textiles and building materials. As you can see, she's wearing a small surgical mask, which is not at all adequate for preventing the breathing of asbestos fibers. These are some statistics that have come out of China. And the more we look, the more we see the asbestos-related diseases occurring. 
and <clears throat> mesothelioma is on the increase. Um, but again, China does not have good vital statistics recording, so we don't really know the extent of disease. But where asbestos-containing products are used, it creates risk. Where is it used principally still in construction? It's still allowed in the United States in brakes and automobiles. It's a fallacy to believe that asbestos has been banned in this country. You can still buy brakes for cars. You can look on the EPA website and find about 20 different uses of asbestos still used in this country, including in some uh, products such as cat litter will contain contamination with asbestos fibers. Firefighters are at a major risk of developing asbestos-related diseases. In a recent study in San Francisco, uh, Boston, and um, I think it was Philadelphia, found a fairly high rate of asbestos-related diseases among firemen. Demolition of buildings is still a major problem because, as I said earlier, Asbestos was used so predominantly in construction for insulation purposes. And this is kind of an interesting picture. I don't know if you can see it, but right here is a guy, that's a man standing there with a hose. That meets the EPA regulation for wetting down when they're tearing down a building. I don't think that stream of water is doing much to control that cloud of dust. but. That's a picture I took, and uh, so uh, it's uh, kind of disheartening that things of this nature still occur. So demolition, ship breaking. I don't know if you saw the most recent issue of National Geographic, but they had a very expose on ship breaking, which is a major issue in Bangladesh and other developing countries along the oceans of the world. We don't allow it uncontrolled in the United States or in Europe, but in these countries, the people can go in with no protection, generally children, you'll see this in National Geographic, but with children, they basically pull the ships up on the shore if you look at Google Earth, you can actually go to the coast of Bangladesh and you will see old ships just pulled up to the beach. There's a picture in National Geographic, but it's even more graphic if you do it yourself on Google Earth. And they literally start tearing the ship apart. Asbestos is only one of the hazards that they have because there are a lot of heavy metals, there are a lot of other contaminants. And the families take the materials, use some of it, sell some of it, but here we have children, we have women, and we have men, all the whole family exposed to these toxic materials, and asbestos is a large part in these old ships. Is exposure to chrysotile safe? I mentioned chrysotile earlier because it is the major form of asbestos that is found in the world, and it's the only form of asbestos that is still sold. The Russian deposits are chrysotile. Canada used to be one of the biggest producers of chrysotile asbestos. The, they have now shut their mines down as of two years ago. So Russia is our biggest producer, Brazil, Kazakhstan, and um, so they are trying to sell the asbestos as chrysotile, which, as I said, is, makes up 95% of the asbestos, and say that the problems that we have seen with asbestos producing mesothelioma, lung cancer, asbestosis, are really all due to these other forms of asbestos, which we call the amphibole form of asbestos, which make up the brown asbestos, amosite, the blue asbestos that I talked about in South Africa a moment ago, and finally, the antholite, which is a, another 
um, uh, type of amphibole asbestos. All of these have made up about 5% of all the asbestos ever used in the world to date. So what is being stated by the companies and the countries that are still producing chrysotile is that this form of asbestos, this white fluffy form, is safe. Um, I might say uh, one of the pr uh, political proponents, uh, Rush Limbaugh, a few years ago, said that this white asbestos was no more dangerous than a cheese uh, chip, one of these little curly cheese chips. So the, well, that's a true statement. <laughs> and, but uh, anyhow, there's a lot of misinformation in my opinion and the scientific community's opinion about this. What are the facts? Toxicology and epidemiology support chrysotile with an increased risk of cancer. Chrysotile and biopersistence it has been stated that chrysotile is not, uh, does not cause disease because of its biopersistence. In other words, it gets into the lung and it leaves the lung rather rapidly compared to the amphiboles because of the um, breakdown of its biopersistence. Some would say that continuous exposure is just the same as biopersistence. In other words, if you continually are exposed to chrysotile on a day-to-day -day basis, you're continually insulting your lungs and putting the chrysotile into your lungs as compared to not uh, being exposed. So biopersistence um, is an issue. And what I would like to say about, about biopersistence is the following, that um, Mesothelial cells have the unique characteristic of engulfing anything, whether a solid, liquid, or gas. Similarly, mesothelioma cells phagatose asbestos fibers. Multiple studies confirm as exposures continue, relative risk of asbestos-related mesothelioma increases. Now, why and what is happening here? We see that in studies that have looked at this issue, that as the fiber exposure increases in intensity, so does the amount of mesothelioma and disease. It's interesting, where does the chrysotile go? Well, it has a low biopersistence in the lung, so it leaves the lung. But where does the mesothelioma occur? It occurs in the serosal tissue surrounding the lung. And if you look, this is exactly where the accumulation of chrysotile fibers end up in the pleural area. Dr. Suzuki at Mount Sinai School of Medicine showed that as compared to the other fiber types, the chrysotile fibers were 30 times more common than the amphiboles in the tissue uh, where the mesotheliomas actually develop. Just another slide to give you a little bit of illustration. This is um, where the tumors develop and um, where we see the chrysotile accumulating. This is supported by multiple studies. Meta-analysis, when looking at multiple studies, continue to support the um, potency of chrysotile versus amphiboles. Are low and background exposures safe? This is an area that we don't have a lot of information on because we've not really been able to study the low, low exposures. But where we have looked, uh, we have seen that we have background exposures as represented by the effluents coming from factories and other sources, plus where people may have occupational or, or more direct exposures, that these do result in an increased risk of developing 
asbestos-related diseases. And again, these have been substantiated in studies throughout the world. And uh, I just threw this slide in for non-mutagenic agents. It is assumed there is some level that is incapable of causing harm or a threshold level as demonstrated by this graph. However, and we know that uh, most oncogens are mutagens and asbestos fibers induce carcinogenicity uh, through mechanisms involving mutagenic and non-mutagenic mechanisms. And In the case of asbestos, we really don't have the ability to see the threshold. What we see is a nonlinear dose response curve where we have an area in the low dose area, as just shown here, which is really the area that we just don't have answers to. But at every epidemiological study that has been able to study these low concentrations, we have shown increased risk of disease as demonstrated by this report to Congress where we looked at low level exposures to family members and household contacts um, and found that even the short term, only a few weeks can result in excess ex exposures to asbestos. We have take-home exposures as demonstrated in this where family members have been shown to develop asbestos-related disease simply from coming into contact with the clothing of people working with asbestos as they shake them out in their home and wash them. Uh, they breathe in the fibers, putting themselves at risk and the studies uh, that are reported in this report over some 50 studies have shown an excess risk of cancer occurring in these type of exposed individuals. OSHA, um, even at the current OSHA standard of 0 0.1 fiber per cc, which by the way was recommended as the standard back in 1976, because that was the lowest concentration that could be adequately measured through the analytical methodology of sampling air and then measuring the number of fibers in the air. But even at this concentration, three to four per thousand people over a working lifetime are at risk of developing an asbestos-related disease. In 1976, I and the institute I was with, NIOSH, recommended banning asbestos in the workplace. That has still not occurred in the United States, even though over 50 countries, including all of the European Union, have banned the use of asbestos. The United States and Canada have not done so, but all of Europe has done so, and we now count, I think it's up to 55 countries have banned all uses of asbestos. When will the United States get on this bandwagon? Politically, I have no idea because every time we work to introduce a bill, we don't get anywhere because it's opposed by the Chamber of Commerce and the major industries that have any litigation issues that might be affected by doing this. So. I don't think any time soon the United States is going to ban asbestos. So we're still going to experience, even at this concentration of 0.1 fiber per cc, excess deaths. Just to show you in the, um, even at these low concentrations, if you go down to what EPA would consider the background concentrations. We're getting down to really low concentrations, 0 0.0004 fibers. Keeping, we allow in the occupational environment 0 0.1 fibers, but if you get down to these very low fibers, even using these risk assessment, 
techniques, nine per million lifetime risk of people exposed with these very low concentrations. This is from the um, Environmental Health Perspectives Journal. And if you look at raising it up a little bit to 0 .002 fibers, twice that, you jump up to 46 per million. So we still have a major risk of developing asbestos-related disease from exposure still occurring in this country. So for those of you that are studying mesothelioma, trying to prevent mesothelioma, trying to treat mesothelioma, unfortunately, you're gonna have a lot of customers and a lot of patients because we haven't done the right thing as a public health program in this country. And if you look at these low dose concentrations, again, just to give you an example, even at these very low concentrations of the OSHA standard of 0.5 to 0.99 fibers per cc, we still have uh, excesses in our odds ratio at the 95% confidence interval um, of disease occurring. So it's not going away, and there are adequate studies. These are in the syllabus. I'm not going to spend time, but I just point them out to you. You can go to, to look yourself and get the actual figures. But there's a lot of disease risk still occurring. So as stated in this paper, our results confirm the previously reported observations of a distinct dose-response relationship even at levels of cumulative exposure below one fiber per year. So initial versus continuous exposure, asbestos is a complete carcinogen. It can both initiate and promote cancer. It's uh, persistent exposure after initial exposure cannot be discounted as irrelevant. Many people think because mesothelioma has such a long latent period that it's only the initial exposures. I think as we heard in a lecture earlier today, it's multiple mutations and multiple hits that result in developing cancer. And so while some will say disregard any exposure that was 15 years or less, I don't believe that is really the case. And the scientific data does not support that. Again, uh, we're seeing an increase in mesotheliomas with duration of exposure. If you weren't having multiple hits, that would not be occurring. That would be leveling off. In conclusion, is there a pandemic of asbestos-related disease? My answer is yes. Is production and consumption decreasing? Well, as we see from this chart, developing countries, consumption is down, but in emerging economies, the consumption is going up. Have high exposures been eliminated? The answer is no. Every time we tear down a building that has asbestos in it, we are releasing fibers into the environment. And you saw the poor example I gave of wetting down uh, is really not effective. Is exposure to chrysotile asbestos safe? The answer, in my opinion, is no. And finally, are low and background exposures safe? We really don't have the answer to that, but what little information we have would indicate that they are not safe. So here is, in conclusion, are asbestos diseases declining? If you look at time versus the amount of disease and you look at the developed economies, we're starting to level off. But if you look at the emerging economies, it's far from leveling off. So what should we do? we should continue to work toward banning the use of asbestos throughout the world, as some 55 countries have already done. However, the United States, Canada, North America 
don't fall into this category. Thank you.